We've had a lot of excitement uh, on the political stage nationally with uh, all of the rhetoric from our Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump and uh, some counterpunching from uh, uh, a, uh, the family of a, an American soldier who happens to be Muslim who, um, who was killed. And uh, this is perhaps the first time we've really seen a member of the Muslim community stand up and, and uh, you know, defend or, or, or talk about just how, how horrible some of these things have been that have been said. So I wanted to find out, this is, uh, we're here today with uh, Samina Sundas, and you are the uh, executive director and founder of American Muslim Voice, Palo Alto-based organization that promotes peace and uh, understanding, and also you're a member of the uh, uh, Santa Clara County uh, Human Relations Commission as well. So. Welcome, Samina. And I just wanted to find out a little bit about, um, why don't you tell us a bit about your organization to start with? Thank you, Sue, for inviting me. Uh, yes, American Muslim Voice Foundation was founded in July 2003. So we are exactly 13 years old now. And the problem was after 9-11, there was too much hate against Muslims. People didn't know enough about Islam or Muslims. So there was people uh, feeling pressured, my fellow Americans were feeling like if they don't know Muslims and it's easy to hate somebody and be afraid of somebody when you don't know them. So God has blessed me with problems, you know, if I see a problem, I just automatically go to a solution. So I thought the best thing we can do is to provide grassroots organization where we will provide first-hand contact between fellow Americans and Muslims. So they can make up their own mind about Islam, about Muslims, who they are. Because I believe there's so much we have in common as human beings, but people always focus on what divides us rather than what binds us. So American Muslim Voice was founded just to change that. Our motto is from fear to friendship. Right, and you've done certain events in Palo Alto as well. Can you just briefly tell us a little bit about some of the things you've done to bring us from fear to friendship? Sure. We have done, uh, not just in Palo Alto, all around the Bay Area, mm -hmm. some of them in Washington, D.C., Woodland, Sacramento, New York, because those are the places we have representation, and we have some of the chapters there. So the events we do basically are very grassroots organizing. People have opportunity to see each other. We started with opening our homes and what we said that this is an opportunity for our fellow Americans to come to our home because there is nothing more sacred than your home. So I thought that if I open my home and say welcome, I will cook a special Pakistani dinner or lunch for you and you can come. There was no agenda. Mm. There was nothing just come here, have a meal with us. And the only requirement I had was, if you already know somebody, please don't sit with them. Find somebody new to know. It doesn't have to be Muslim. Whoever you don't know, get to know them. We are providing a fertile land to just sow the seeds of new friendships. And that's what we want you to do. What kind of response did you get? It was amazing. The first open house I had in my home there were about, I think, close to 75 people. Wow. And there were so many faiths and so many ethnicities that were uh, just, you know, represented. Mm -hmm. Palo, uh, Mercury News did a very good job about writing the story about that. And then we started doing Ramadan dinners, mm -hmm. iftar dinners. And then we started doing peace picnics. Peace picnics, especially, I started doing because I realized after doing many events, that people who come to these, they already have a little bit idea who we are. Mm -hmm. So they were ready to take that plunge. They trusted us enough to come to our house because trust is both ways. If I'm inviting somebody, when they ex accept that my invitation, that means they're trusting me mm -hmm. to come sit with me. They thought it is a safe environment and somebody is just you know welcoming them. 
So I was very grateful when they were very open to coming to these events. Mm -hmm. And then we started Peace Picnic just for the reasons that when we do things in behind the doors, whether they are conventions or everything else behind the door, people who come, only they will get to know what's happening. And if you're building a beloved community, peace, you need to plant seeds in many, many people. So I thought peace picnics would be a great idea. Even people who are not ready to come join us, mm. they could see different races, religions, old, young kids. White Americans are just, you know, doing face painting for kids and Muslims, Arabs, Pakistanis, Chinese, everybody's bringing different salad and all that. Mm -hmm. And it just created really a beautiful story, a new story for people to see that you don't have to have just your own kind of people to have fun. You could have fun with anybody everywhere. Mm -hmm. So now we're also facing, uh, we go from story to history where we've got uh, sort of groundbreaking, both negative and positive things that are happening right now. Um, with Donald Trump's rhetoric, could you speak a little bit about how that is affecting people? Sure. Uh, I understand the uh, Council on, is on American is Islamic Relations just came out with a report that really does show that there is an increase, there's been an increase on, in the number of um, negative experiences, let us say, you know, outright um, uh, attacks sometimes on people and incidents that have occurred. And that because, report suggested yeah. that it's in part due to, you know, political rhetoric right. um, and statements like the ones Trump has, you know, made last week about, or this week about the, the slain yeah. American soldier. Exactly. So, you know, the hate existed in our nation for a long, long time. When 9-11 happened, President Bush came up with some of the policies that just made it normal for people to profile Muslims. We have all of a sudden felt like we are washed, screened at the airports, washed everywhere. So that was, we were being profiled. Now, when Donald Trump started all this hate that he's going to ban Muslims and do this with that community and all that, now Donald Trump has legalized hate in our country. And when it is up and open and they are encouraged by a presidential you know, candidate, that has taken this hate to a totally different level. Mm. If I am not mistaken, I think they have said that increase is about 34% mm -hmm. since Donald Trump started you know, throwing his things out that Muslims are totally horrible people. And what people don't realize, there are 1.5 or 6 billion Muslims. Worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you really understand that number, you will see, I just jokingly tell people, if Muslims started just pinching people, you will <laughs> feel the pain. Mm -hmm. But there is a very, very small minority of the Muslims who don't know Islam. They do these things in the name of Islam, mm -hmm. but they don't know the alphabet of Islam. So it has a huge impact. And honestly, I have been saying that for a long time. Donald Trump doesn't scare me. Right. What scares me is that many of my fellow Americans hate Muslims and immigrants that much that he's actually a presidential candidate. I'm curious if there are um, really strong, concerted efforts within the local Muslim community organized around, you know, getting the vote out, um, sort of just awareness of the election stuff, efforts like that to get people more engaged. Definitely. Our community has been doing that. Before I joined, before I just started American Muslim Voice, I was actually a national coordinator for our American Muslim Alliance whose job was just to prepare Muslims to run for public offices, mm -hmm. anywhere from uh, school board mm -hmm. to the Congress. So to tell you just how much effort that was being put, in election 2000, there were over 770 Muslims who ran for offices mm -hmm. nationally, from school board all the way to Congress. Mm -hmm. In election 2002, there were less than 100. So you could see wow. the impact already then. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
but since then we have started doing special efforts in that and if you see now there are two muslim congressmen mm -hmm. one from minnesota and one from indiana first muslim congressman was keith allison who was elected from minnesota mm. and the second is andre carson and he is from indiana so there were good things that happened too muslim community woke up and then you know started getting engaged more and more slowly and now every organization every person who can just you know talk encourage other people they are doing that at a very individual level mm -hmm. and at the very organizational level mm. and that's what we have been doing actually i have been uh, telling people it's every day when i turn on the computer when i start my post i have a little post that told people that until november 8th i'm going to keep posting this do everything in your power to make sure that you are registered people around you are registered you vote even people who are not registered today you can play the bigger role not even being the citizens yet mm -hmm. drive organize get out to vote you know register people all that and those are the efforts that are being done mm. so we've also seen <coughs> some of the fear of of in the in some of the american populace mm -hmm. uh, anti-Muslim feeling and fear of Muslims. Um, how has this rhetoric, has it created more fear or do you, uh, amongst Muslims about their position in the United States? Definitely, or, yeah. definitely, because ever since, you know, 9-11, people have been feeling that, but never more than now since Donald Trump started openly saying that, encouraging people to hate each other and, you know, divisive policies and all that. So. That's why our motto is from fear to friendship, because Muslims are afraid of fellow Americans. My fellow Americans are afraid of Muslims. So it's from both sides. That's the reason for many, many years, Muslims did not come out. They were afraid of coming out, being known. They said, if we just lay low, this shall pass. The reason I started this organization, because I already had friends who were from diverse communities. And they, I asked them, how do you feel? Because my community is telling me, just lay low, don't do anything, don't, you know, draw attention to yourself, and then this will pass. And I said, I don't believe it, it will pass like this. And they said, stand up and start pushing. Now, I'm not a pushy person, so I couldn't do pushing, but I came up with a more creative idea that let's start feeding people. Right. By feeding them, bringing them to our homes, I had a better chance of sticking with this because even if I push somebody in a madness just a few minutes, I won't be able to sustain. Right. In light of that, sort of the fear of speaking up and speaking out and being more public, which is you know, completely understandable, um, how are people within the Muslim community reacting to uh, Khazir Khan, the, the father of the American soldier, his comments at the Democratic National Convention, you know, his, you know in really strong words, against Donald Trump on such this, you know, enormous, you know, what, what bigger platform do you have besides one of these conventions? Well, I'm very, very, very grateful to DNC for bringing Khazir Khan and his wife and their story in public. Mm -hmm. There are many people, Muslims, who have been doing amazing things, sacrificing for making America a better place ever since 9-11, some even before. So... What Khazar Khan has done is that at a national platform, God blessed him with that. They paid a high price for that attention. Yeah. But I'm glad their son is gone, but they are doing service to Muslim community and to all of my fellow Americans. Doesn't matter what your race, religion is, because if this kind of story comes up, there is so much up, down, and look at the follow-ups, everything. Now they go to Khizr Khan. Today they were just saying, oh, somebody gave Donald Trump Purple Heart. What do you think about that? So I'm glad. He has gotten even more confident now. I just looked at him today when he was saying, Donald Trump, you did not serve. You do not have the, you know, you should not have taken this Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. You should have pinned that Purple Heart on that man and hugged him and don't take that from him. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you know, he is more confident and I'm glad he is. He's speaking not just for Muslims. I think he would just um, 
uplift all the immigrants and then this kind of chances should be given to all immigrants because there are so many stories and in DNC I have saw that they have done that for people with disability mm -hmm. people who are being deported the dreamers and all that so I am so glad that they had a chance to bring their story because through stories you touch people I think Hazel Khan said yeah putting you know, humanizing mm -hmm. everybody thinks Muslims are just these terrorists but you have put a face these are the people, these couple, this family is a gold star family. Mm -hmm. So, and how he behaved with them is mind boggling. You know, he did not even acknowledge. When Khrizal Khan is saying, you have never sacrificed, Donald Trump started saying, oh, I have created thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. Does this man really doesn't understand the difference between achievements and sacrifice mm -hmm. and he wants to be the president of our country that's well and so, it's also having a real impact just politically i mean from both sides of the aisle a lot of criticism of these comments and yeah um and it's interesting too that this is you know th this story has a life it's been a days long sort of conflict and which ongoing. is so different yeah but one of the other things that I, when as i hear you speak about mr khan I see your face light up. I see you smile. And I've known you for a long time. And I know that you've struggled so much with trying to bring people out and mm -hmm. get them, you know, to, to bridge this gap that we've had in, the, totally. in this country and locally. I mean, really on a local level. And um, so it, it obviously, I mean, this has, is it a turning point for Muslims in the United States now in terms of, you know, maybe feeling... A, more confident that they can speak out and that they can show themselves. I think so. I think uh, the Republican Party actually lost a lot of Muslims. I remember in election 2000, we voted for Bush as a block vote. Hmm. Like I said, you know, I was the national coordinator for that political organization. So we told all Muslims all around the U.S., vote for Bush. The reason was because we asked both candidates to meet with Muslims because we wanted to know how are you going to treat Muslims? Would they be hired in your cabinet? Some position and all that. And the other party did not, DNC did not meet with a uh, Muslim leadership. Mm -hmm. Bush did that and he said he will uh, repeal the, not Patriot Act, uh, secret there was secret evidence, something like that. There was a case really that you could just go and pick up Muslims and you don't have to say anything to anybody, just without any cause. So he said he would repeal that. But after that, then 9-11 happened. And you wouldn't believe that day, Muslim leadership was supposed to meet with President Bush at 3 o'clock in wow. the White House. So of course, that didn't happen. And... But Muslims are, I'm hoping, because that's what I have been asking my fellow Muslims, to please come out because I believe my fellow Americans are kind, compassionate, loving, caring people. And if they truly know us, there would be no problem. Since I know both parties, Muslims and my fellow Americans, I know there is so much we have in common. And... When I saw that Mr. Khazar speak, I said, yes, I am so glad this family has given that chance. So that's why I keep saying that I'm glad DNC gave them chance because there are many, many, many Muslims who would speak out. They are at that point now where they're done. Yeah. And then again, people used to, if some terrorist act happened, it doesn't matter where, all these Muslim organizations used to just say, we condemn this, we condemn this, we condemn this. And I just told people one day, I said, they said, why don't you send a statement? I said, why should I? I didn't do anything. These people who call themselves Muslims, they're not related to me. They didn't ask my permission. Why should I condemn that? And then I asked my fellow Americans, because I have been building friendships and all that. I said, I'm going to ask you something. Please be honest with me. This is how I feel. When somebody asks me to condemn this terrorist act, I feel like somebody just pushed me out of being an American. Hmm. And they said, you don't need to, because you have already 
done this through serving America. I want my fellow Americans to know I have cleaned highways here. I have served at the emergency room in Stanford Hospital. I have served in my kids' band in their Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, soccer, basketball. I have volunteered every place I had a chance to. And now since 2003, bigger part of my life goes to doing this. Why? Because I am an American and I don't need to tell anybody that I condemn this, I condemn this. Because you feel that, you feel that you're an American and why, and should, why should you be singled out as a yeah. Muslim? Right. So, and unless, then one time somebody was saying, oh, I don't even remember which radio station started asking people, you know what, uh, you should just bring one million Muslims out in Sacramento on the streets. And one of my Muslim community members said, do you think it's a good idea, should we even try? I said, no, let me talk to that person. I just called them, not, not during the program, I just called them, I said, you just, I heard you would like a million Muslims to come out and condemn whatever is happening, the terrorism. He said, yes, don't you think it should be a good idea? I said, I will do that under one condition. He said, what would that be? I said, you bring 10 million Americans against Iraq war and I'll bring 1 million Muslims. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then he just hung up because this is ridiculous. <laughs> there are not 1 million Muslims probably in California anyways. And then you want me to do that. So no, we are not going to do that. Mm. So now the point was that now other organization finally, you know, got the point. I'm saying whatever you do, you send these statements. Nobody reads it. Nobody pays attention. And they still ask you, why aren't the Muslims saying anything? So I just started asking people the other day. I said, okay, tell me when Trayvon Martin was murdered, when somebody asked me that, uh, you should condemn them. Why didn't you? I said, okay, I have a question. Please raise your hand or stand up if you did something when Martin Trayvon was mm -hmm. murdered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many of you did something? Did you call Washington? Did you call the police department there? Did you even just say, let's say you didn't want to do anything? Did you write an op-ed piece saying how horrible this is? Mm -hmm. Of course nobody did that. I said, so why is that that you didn't do that? If you didn't do that in your own nation because you think you had nothing to do with that, you don't relate to that crazy white man, so why should you? It's the same thing I feel. Right. They understood that then. But now we have something else with, with uh, Mr. Khan, and, and that has, he has spoken out, and mm -hmm. he's, and, but he's spoken out I mean, in much the way that, you know, we, the world has seen Holocaust, and we have a long history of that and that has come you know worldwide and mm -hmm. certainly in the in the 1930s and the 1940s the things that led up to the second world war mm -hmm. and people were silent right yes. they were silent and an entire group of people in this case it was the jews who were being targeted mm -hmm. they were also silent and went along with you know just okay you're going to move us here you're going to do something make us wear gold stars or whatever it was mm -hmm. um, and then there, as a result of that, they were, you know, murdered, mm -hmm. right? Persecuted and murdered. Yeah. So, I mean, I think do Muslims see, now see that, that it's really a, a life and death type of thing for them as well, that it could escalate to that with, with the rhetoric that's been going on? I think people really not taking Donald Trump as seriously. And I think that's a bigger mistake than anything else. Because... Again, Donald Trump, if he could say all this and more, that wouldn't worry me. But the people who voted for him, that number worries me. Right. So, yes, it could happen. Then, not just what happened to Jewish, what happened to Japanese Americans here? Right. Right? Nobody spoke. These people were sent to detention centers. They just, you know took their property, they took their homes, they took everything from them. Right. And you, do you feel that that's a real threat that that could possibly happen here? Oh, Muslims have Muslims. been feeling that ever since 9-11. Mm -hmm. It's not new mm -hmm. because we keep, because I was very active during that time. And there were about 82,000 Muslims 
who were registered under the program of Nasir. It, at that time it was INS special registration just to catch some terrorists here. Those were people who came on student visas, uh, business visas, you know, different kind of visas. They had to register male members of, uh, from the Muslim communities, from Muslim countries. I think there were 25 or 26 countries with the exception of North Korea. Everybody was Muslim country. So if you're 16, till the day you die, you're supposed to register. 82,000 mm. people were registered. 13,000 were deported, mm. but not a single terrorist was caught. And that money wasted so much, that program wasted so much money that we started a campaign, American Muslim was started a campaign against that when they, were, they started saying they are going to re-register every year, all these people. So I said that is ridiculous. So we're talking about, let's clarify for people a little bit that this registration was of immigrants that came in? Muslim immigrants. Mus Muslim immigrants from different countries that they believed were, were coming, could possibly be coming from nations where there, where there were terrorists. I think it was Korean. believed that they were terrorists. That they were terrorists. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why they were registered. Mm -hmm. And none of them were terrorists. People just like, just like say they were here, like there are 11 million uh, undocumented Muslims, uh, Latinos are here. Right. So it was the same way those people came with some kind of a visa, but they overstayed. So those were the people who were registered students. They all had, you know, so if somebody, a student didn't register at the right time, or he took courses and one of the course dropped, so he did not qualify that visa. Those were the people just, you know, registered and then detained and then deported. Mm -hmm. That's like, mm -hmm. So, and that happened right after 9-11. You mentioned before we started filming that there are some upcoming events locally that you're organizing. Sure. That sort of peace and, and the vision of your group. Yes. So there are two programs coming in Santa Clara County. One is the flag raising ceremony that Supervisor Dave Cortezis have been doing that for Pakistanis to just uplift their morale. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you hear about Pakistan or Muslims, all you hear is about negative and terrorism and all that. So the flag raising would be on Sunday, August 14th at the county building, 70 West Heading. And then the September 11th, we have been doing peace picnics ever since we celebrated the honored our victims on 9-11th, 10th anniversary. So we have built relationships with some of the people, an organization called September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrow. Mm. And they are the people who lost their loved ones. They have uh, husbands, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, and they founded this organization to say, do not start wars and start harassing Muslims in our name. They are doing global peace work. Mm. So I thought this is something amazing that if they can do peace work after losing their loved ones, none of us have any reason not to do that. Mm. So I reached out to them and I said, this is how I feel and I want to get to know you. I flew to New York. We had a meeting with all of their board members wow. and we have just really built a beautiful rela mm. relationship with them. And at our conventions, uh, three or four of the members have come and spoken at our events. Mm. Is there going to be a, a walk, like a, a multi-faith walk of some kind yes. as well? Yes. So it's going to start at 2 o'clock. And uh, that will be uh, on the same, on September 11th? On September 11th. So it would be a 2 o'clock walk. They would go to different places. It's starting at a Jewish congregation. In Palo Alto? In Palo Alto on Elma. And then they will go to Old Lady... Uh, rosary, I think some kind of oh, church, okay. and then Lady from there rosary. they will. There is another church they will stop by there, and then they will come to Mitchell Park, where we will finish with the peace picnic that American Muslim Voice has been organizing since the tenth anniversary. So I talked to them, September 11th families, that how would you feel if rather than just doing a candlelight vigil in your uh, loved one's loving memory, we started doing peace picnic in their uh, memory. They love the idea. So since the 11th year, we have been doing peace picnics. Mm. Well, 
I think that's great. Uh, I, I just wanted to just follow up with one last thing about sure. countywide. You're on the uh, Human Relations Commission. I actually served on a Human Relations Commission for many, many years. But since last two years, I had an auto accident and that is just limiting my activities. And just a couple of months ago, I took a leave of absence or retirement or whatever you want to call it. But they have given me a very honorable uh, title forever. So, <laughs> is there something that uh, that that the county can do uh, or is doing? Are there any anything that you know about that is happening on the county uh, level? Not right now, but I spoke with President Dave Cortese, and I told him that I would like to, after I'm done with this event uh, in September, then I would like to organize a press conference and bring all the different ethnicities and faiths and just send a message to, you know, Donald Trump and people like him that you're not going to be able to break us. We are standing together and we are going to support each other and we are going to really, really stand by each other. We will not let another Japanese-American kind of internment happen. And that is thanks to our Japanese-American friends because they organize things very quickly. They have gone through that so they know what it is. And I have gone there to Tule Lake camp. I think every American should go to those camps and understand what we did and what our silence allows the governments to do. And it's just like they divided. It happens again, same way. They divided that community into two. They put them in internment camps and then they asked them to go fight for America. Some of the people agreed, some of the people who said no. If you put us in internment camps, then we are not going to fight for America. So there was a split, even within the families. One brother would say, we should do that to just prove our loyalty. The other said, no, I don't need to prove my loyalty. I am an American, and if I'm put in this internment camp, I'm not going to do that. So they were labeled as no-nos. There was a stigma attached to that. I didn't know. So we were sitting in that hall where people had gathered and Wonderful speeches were happening. And I just raised my hand after that. And I said, can I say something? I actually asked my friend Grace first. When they said, can you please stand up, the people who have served there in the army. People stood up. And then they said, people who have not served the army during that day, can you stand up? And hardly anybody stood up. And I asked Grace, so did it mean everybody served? She said, no, there's a stigma attached with no-nos. So those people would not stand up. Only few would stand up. So I said, okay. Then I raised my hand. So I asked, there was a MC, Karen. So she said, you have a comment? I said, I have a question and a comment. I said, I don't understand why the donors didn't, uh, you know, raise their hands. I'm here to tell you it is because of your courage. Today, when the similar situations are happening to Muslims, I have the courage to stand up and say no to hate, no to divisionness, no to all these things that they are sending us. And I just want to tell you that you are my heroes and I honor you and I salute you. You wouldn't believe that 30 second comments changed the whole environment there. Karen said, I cannot believe it took a Muslim sister to come and say that we honor these people. And then she asked again, can you please stand up? And more than half the hall stood up. And then I was adopted for three days by these older Japanese-American <laughs> couple. Wherever I went, they hugged me, they kissed me, they thanked me. So it takes somebody else to recognize and say that, that I validate you. And is that and that is the case today as well? Yes. You would say with the, with, it will also take somebody else it would take somebody else. I'm country. glad that Khizr Khan did that. But I need some other community members. And Japanese Americans played that role. When 9-11 happened, they were the first people who came to our rescue. And they stood up with us. Even when the Donald Trump started all this rhetoric, they organized a multi-faith, multi-ethnicity press conference many, many months ago to say, we are not going to allow this to happen. Okay. So. That is what gives you courage. Collective courage has powers that nobody can believe. 
That's great. Well, I think we're just about out of time, and um, that's all for this week. And uh, if you would like to get more news and information, you can go to paloaltoonline.com or visit us on Twitter at Palo Alto Weekly. Thank you.